Hello and uh, welcome to Granada Reports, live with the latest across the North West. Hello on the programme this evening. A tenfold increase in flu cases. One health worker tells us she thought it'd take her life. My chest was really full and I, I did feel like I was going to die. I said to the doctor, I'm, I'm dying, I'm going to die here. A warning over medicine supplies to treat strep A infections, as one school records more than 40 pupils with symptoms. As a cold snap takes hold, Manchester United open their doors to become a warm hub for those struggling to heat their homes. A surprise from her heroes, how City superfan Hayley will be leading out the team at the Manchester Derby. Join me later where everybody's getting into the festive spirit on Christmas clothes in Thornton near Blackpool. And the cold theme continues with frost, ice and even some snow in the forecast. But how long will it last? The details are coming up. Well, first tonight, I didn't think I was going to get out of intensive care. I thought I was going to die. The words of a midwife from Cheshire who's urging people to get their flu jab after almost dying from the virus. And Martine Drinkle says she was struggling to breathe when she was rushed to A&E at Leighton Hospital in Crewe, where she works. A colleague told her if she'd arrived any later, she probably wouldn't have survived. Well, her warning comes as the NHS says it's seen a tenfold increase in the number of patients in hospital with flu. In a moment, we'll also hear about a rise in scarlet fever amongst children this winter. But first, this report from Anne O'Connor. Midwife Martine Drinkle is back at work, part-time for now, bringing new lives into the world at Leighton Hospital. Weeks ago, she truly believed her life would end as she was admitted to the hospital's intensive care with flu, hallucinating and unable to breathe properly. I was um, absolutely dripping in sweat. Literally, um, my chest was really full and um, I did feel like I was going to die. I said to the doctor, I'm, I'm dying, I'm going to die here. My husband and daughter then visited me and the look on their face, my husband um, was absolutely traumatised by him. I can remember just looking at my daughter thinking, I'm not going to see you um, get married. And um, she looked at me, she said, Mum, I just want you home. Her eyes were really red and she said, I just want you home. You're still very emotional about I it. I am, yeah, I have, yeah, yes I am, yeah. I was pretty poorly. Latest NHS England figures show there was an average of 344 people in hospital with flu. That's compared to 34 this time last year. Covid lockdowns may have lowered our immunity. The NHS in Cheshire and Merseyside says there's been a fall in uptake of vaccinations. The NHS now says it's facing a winter triple-demic of Covid, flu and high demand on urgent care. At Leighton, staff in clinical areas are keeping their masks on all winter. We thought, didn't we, that Covid was terrible and that we'd have to be vaccinated because it would kill us. We don't think that about flu, do we? No, there's often a misconception around flu because it's been around a, a lot longer than, than COVID. But as Martine really eloquently expressed how serious it can be, you, even for fit and healthy people sometimes that catch the flu, you can develop sepsis from, from, um, from the flu, um, which can lead to a hospital admission and maybe, maybe a critical care admission. Martine is a fit and healthy farmer's wife aged 44. As a frontline NHS worker, she's one of the 33 million in the UK eligible for a free flu jab. She was due the jab when she fell ill. Have the flu vaccine, don't think twice. If you're thinking about it, have it, just have it now. You really don't want to go through what me and my family have gone through. It's been, it's been hor horrible. Martine is now gradually getting better and hopes to be well enough to work Christmas Day, as she has done for years. Anne O'Connor, ITV News, Leighton Hospital. Oh, very good advice there from Martine. Um, and meanwhile, government figures show the North West has the highest rate of scarlet fever, which is caused by the strep A bacteria. In Cheshire, one school has introduced COVID-style precautions after a spike in symptoms. Leighton Academy says around 40 pupils and staff are off with strep A symptoms, scarlet fever and chickenpox. Now, despite usually being mild, severe strep A infections have led to the deaths of nine children across the country this winter. And pharmacists are warning drug supplies could run out as demand increases. Tim Scott has the latest. 
Leighton Academy and crew has confirmed that around 40 children are off sick with either scarlet fever or strep A symptoms and chickenpox. Some of the staff here are also affected. The school has now introduced Covid-style measures like sanitising and extra cleaning of classrooms to combat the outbreak. It comes as the North West has the highest scarlet fever rates in the country, with nearly 1,000 cases. The region has the second highest figures for Strep A, although the numbers are relatively low, just one in 100,000. At the moment, we're seeing around five or six times the, the amount of scarlet fever than we've seen in the last couple of years. Parents will know their children best and they will know when that child needs urgent medical attention. For most people, if we're just talking about a cough, a sore throat or a runny nose, then that stuff can be dealt with at home. That's self-limiting and it's just looking after yourself. Strep A is a bacterial infection that causes scarlet fever and can have far more serious effects. Antibiotics can be used to treat Strep A, but they're in short supply, according to Manchester consultant and pharmacist Zeshan Romani. Today, again, I've asked my staff, are we able to, to get it? And they've just said most of the antibiotics are still out of stock. We're able to get some drips and drabs, but they're not always suitable. So, for example, with some of them capsules available, but the liquid for children isn't. Meanwhile, in Parliament today, the Prime Minister denied there were shortages of antibiotics. There are no current shortages of drugs available to treat this, and there are well-established procedures in place to ensure that that remains uh, the case. Mr Romani said he doesn't understand the government's response. So my reaction was the same as about 200 plus pharmacy owners that are on a WhatsApp group with myself. We were all shocked. Where is this supply, this magic supply that the government are talking about? We can't seem to find it and it's not just me, it's all of us. Meanwhile, with cases of scarlet fever and strep A remaining high, parents are being advised to check NHS and government websites for a list of symptoms and details of when they should act. Tim Scott, ITV News. Another news tonight, border force workers are striking at Manchester Airport over Christmas in a dispute over pay and conditions. The PCS unions say their members who work at Passport Control will walk out for eight days between December the 23rd and New Year's Eve. They argue workers are skipping meals and can't afford heating. The airport's warning of flight cancellations and long passenger queues and it's urging the union and the border force to find a solution. The winner of Art's prestigious Turner Prize will be announced in Liverpool later. The announcement has returned to the city for the first time in 15 years, having helped launch Liverpool's year as the European capital of culture. The nominations will be on display at Tate's Liverpool until the 19th of March. And here's what's still to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Mary. Coming up on the programme, raids in Germany as dozens are accused of plotting a coup. 25 people have been arrested on suspicion of planning to overthrow the government. Also ahead, what a border force walkout means for Christmas travel plans as workers go on strike. Plus the plunging temperatures, we'll have the very latest on weather warnings in place overnight. And the fighting talk from England as they prepare to take on France in the World Cup. Do join me for those stories and much more at 6.30. Well, now it's just temperatures continue to plummet. The cost of living crisis takes hold and bills continue to soar. One of Manchester's biggest football clubs has opened its doors to the local community. Manchester United is providing hot drinks, snacks and a place to get warm over the next few weeks as part of its winter campaign. Our reporter Emma Sweeney is there for us tonight. And Emma, to some of those living nearby, this could be making a real difference. Yes, that is absolutely right, Vicky. I mean, we all woke up this morning, didn't we? And we felt those freezing temperatures, frost on the windscreens, also on the tops of houses. And also, of course, there's that uh, rise in energy bills as well for people to contend with. But here at Manchester United, they are trying to make out that they can uh, help the local community as much as possible. Let's bring in uh, Jim Liggett, Operations Director. Tell us what's going on here. 
So we've just launched our winter campaign, United By Your Side. We recognise it's cold, the increasing cost of living. We want to help local fans, local community and the people across Manchester. So we've opened up our doors here at the Red Cafe, 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock on a Monday and a Wednesday, where we give out free hot pies, free soups, hot drinks, and you can come and enjoy the company here at Old Trafford. For some people, though, of course, those hot pies, those hot drinks, they won't be enough, and you've also tried to make sure that you help them in a wider sense as well. Absolutely. We recognise that loneliness and mental ill health can be an issue this time of year, so we work very closely with uh, Manchester Mind. Um, we also work with the local authorities, so we can signpost those people that are vulnerable to the correct support services. We've also got other uh, things going on here tonight, with St John Ambulance uh, giving uh, first aid training, all free of charge, so come along and enjoy the warmth. Thank you very much for talking to us. Well, let's go and talk then to some of those people who are benefiting from tonight's warm space. So, first of all, to John. John, tell us why you've come down. Hiya. Well, I've come down here to enjoy the hospitalities. You know, I got invited by my local councillor. That's Lawrence Walt. She's just on the other table. And uh, thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, it's nice. And you've had a... I saw you earlier on, you had a little pie and you had some soup. Tell us what it was I like. was forced to eat a pucker pie, yeah, steak, and it was gorgeous. And a bottle of coke and some soup. Stuff. Thank you very much for talking to us, Laurie. Uh, you're here as well. How important is it for a club as big as United that they take part in this kind of community action? Well, the community, i.e. the supporters like we are, are the lifeblood of the club. So I think it's nice that they're giving back um, to the community who supported them over the generations. Do you think you'll be here over the coming weeks as well? Well, possibly, yeah. I mean, I do come to the home matches anyway, so um, I bring my um, disabled cousin, I'm his carer. But yeah, I'll perhaps pop in, uh, pop in again and uh, look forward to the hospitality and meeting new people as I've done tonight. Well, thank you very much uh, for talking to us. Now, Manchester United, very keen to stress that this is open uh, to everyone. Their doors are open uh, to everybody. Under 16s, they will need to make sure that they come uh, with uh, an adult. Now, it is uh, running next Monday and next Wednesday from 5 till 8 o'clock. And then the following week, it'll be next Monday and next Thursday. Back to the studio. Thanks, Emma. We need more of those, don't we? What a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, uh, uh, Joe is in the studio with us now, and uh, Joe, as uh, Emma just said, we really are now starting to feel that drop in temperatures, aren't we? We really are. I mean, it's not unusual for this time of year, of course, and last night down to around minus three quite widely. We'd expect that at this time of year. I think what's different about this particular cold snap is the prolonged cold weather we're going to have over the next few days, well into the weekend and even into Monday. So it's really a good idea to keep an eye on elderly neighbours and relatives because that's when it gets really chilly over days and nights over a prolonged period is when people start to go downhill so it's not unusual this time of year we've got an arctic blast of air coming down from the north and a few showers at both coasts now those are going to migrate inland we could see a little bit of sleet and snow over the next few days but it's the temperatures by day it's going to struggle quite a few degrees below average for the time of year and by night widely it's going to be hard frost so minus five minus six perhaps in a few rural spots over the next few nights but the real issue probably will be ice over the next few days we've got some warnings in place from the Met Office and that's just catering to that really footpaths and roads are going to be very icy where we see any moisture so do take care. All the details, of course, coming up later on in the weather. Yeah, feeling cold just hearing you talk about it. So, <laughs> Joe, <No>. thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Definitely big coat weather. Ooh, <laughs> lots to come on the programme, including... The fighting pride of Ellesmere Port, how Paul's preparing to face a Japanese icon in Tokyo. And let there be light. We're on the Lancashire Street that's brimming with Christmas cheer. Uh, OK, uh, time for sport now, and we can hear from the region's newest manager, and he's a very well-known face. Here's Mike. That's right, he certainly is. He was a brilliant player for both Manchester City and for Liverpool. Can he now turn his hand to management? Colo Torre says he is relishing the unbelievable challenge of becoming the new manager of Wigan Athletic. The former Ivory Coast international joins the Championship Club on a three-and-a-half-year deal from Leicester City, where he was the first team coach. Today, he introduced his coaching team, which includes former Crawley manager Kevin Betsy and Ashfield Johan who also joins from Leicester. When the opportunity came, I think there's no doubt it's Wigan. You know, uh, with the history that uh, Wigan have, with the manager that they had, they had in the past, Roberto Martinez. And for me, it was no doubt, you know, you got to go for it, definitely. For me, I like challenge. 
and this is a great, great challenge for me and uh, my staff, of course. You have assembled one of the most diverse coaching teams in English football. That feels very significant, is it? It's all about uh, the talents and these two coaches that I have with me are great coaches. I know them very well, very intelligent guys, hardworking, young, you know, and that's uh, really, really important. I think ethnicity um, is listen, it's something that people recognise straight away. Uh, it shouldn't be a limiting factor. It also shouldn't be a, a defining factor in, in, in people's job roles or what they do. I think there's talented people from across all communities in the world, uh, in football in England, and I think, um, yeah, when people come together to, to work together, that, that's probably the best thing. Well, now to a massive moment for one of the region's best boxers. Next week, Paul Butler, who hails from Ellesmere Port, will take on one of the most feared fighters in the sport, Japan's Naoya Inoue, for the crown of undisputed world bantamweight champion. And these are the scenes that greeted Paul when he arrived in Japan. Huge media interest in this fight, as his opponent is a national hero there. Well, I caught up with Paul before he flew out and learned a little bit more about his opponent. He's known as the Monster. Naoya Inoue is a sporting icon in Japan, a world champion at three different weights. He's never been beaten in a 10-year professional career and has knocked out nearly all of his opponents. So what a challenge for Paul Butler. At 34, he's reaching the end of his own very successful boxing career, but believes the best is yet to come. He didn't have to take this fight, but asked for it. Why mess around with voluntary defences? I could have had one or two, but go for the big boy, go for the man in the division um, and try and unify the whole division. Why not? He, he's, he's an incredible fighter. He's a pound for pound, number one, number two. Um, and it's the biggest fight out there in the division, in the division so I'd, I'd be silly not to want that fight. At stake for the two bantamweights isn't just a world title, it's all the world titles. This is the rarest of moments in boxing, a fight to become the undisputed champion when every belt is on the line. Butler's WBO crown and Inouye's IBF, WBA and WBC titles. It's a fantastic achievement for a British fighter to be involved in the magnitude of a fight like this. And, um, yeah, he's earned it. There's a, I'd say, Ferguson, Paul, say, clock mentality um, about us at the moment. Like, don't care what anyone's saying, um, backs her up. And um, we've just got to use people's um, criticism as fuel to push him that little bit harder in training. This is where Butler will attempt to pull off that shock, the Ariaki Arena, which was a venue during the Tokyo Olympics. But in another rarity for boxing, the clash takes place on a Tuesday rather than Saturday night. Very respectful, the Japanese. Uh, the previous fights I've watched, it's all just when they're landing a good shot, it's, it's a lot of clapping. There's no, they're not like the Brits and the Americans where they're all screaming and roaring. Um, but you will have my crowd in a corner somewhere and they'll be kicking off and they'll be going mad and, and listen, they'll know we're there. I, I, I'll guarantee you that, they'll know, they'll know Wells me a quarter there. To win it, it'd mean the absolute world to me. Listen, I'm, I've got the chance, I'm in with a chance, so let's go out there and do it. Good luck. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Whatever the outcome, the two-time world champ has had a career to be proud of. But might there just be one last glorious moment still to come? Getting that winning feeling. FOW. Sponsors of the Granada Sport Report. Now, tonight, Manchester City women continue their defence of the League Cup with a trip to Liverpool. But already they have an eye on Sunday's Manchester derby when a record crowd of 40,000 is expected at the Etihad Stadium. Among them will be City superfan Hayley Tomkinson, who's had a very special surprise ahead of the game, as David Chisnell reports. Can you say hello to Chloe in a second, please? <laughs> A city surprise for a city super fan. It's what dreams are made of, just like when you score a goal in the playground. 
Manchester City's Chloe Kelly and Sandy McKeever made a special visit to the Year 6 class at Ravensbury Community School, where they delivered an early Christmas present to one of the pupils ahead of this weekend's Manchester derby. So we'd like to welcome you to the Etihad and you're going to be mascot for us. Excited. I'm never going to hear the end of it, to be honest. <laughs> Bless her, Hayley in tears when we gave her a mascot opportunity. It's great to see so many young kids with smiles on their faces. Me and Sand were that kid one day in a, in a classroom, just can't wait for lunchtime to get out on the, on the pitch. Well, Hayley got to meet the players at the City in the Community session after dressing up as one for her class's recent Celebrate Me Day. 11-year-old will now be the mascot in front of 40,000 fans at the Etihad for the Derby in the Women's Super League on Sunday. I went to a match in 2019 that I slept halfway through. <laughs> Which match was that? I don't know. It was a city one with another... I don't know, to be honest. I slept through it all. <laughs> I was about seven, eight at the time. It's going to be such a big game. Um, you know, a home derby as well. I don't think there's anything much more special. Um, you know, I think it'll be a really exciting day for Haley, but for the players as well, and, you know, hopefully we can get the three points. While two of Manchester City's players were delivering a surprise, two more were receiving one. Steph Horton and Haley Rasso have been enjoying some extra target practice alongside the best female dance player in the world, Fallon Sherrick. It's amazing. It's like to have opportunities like that and to meet a superstar like Fallon and being a female as well that's been successful at a sport. It's just, it just gives you a little bit of a switch off and we had some good fun. While Fallon's football skills need some practice, she's a pioneer of darts and a big promoter of all female sports. I didn't think the world cared so much to begin with. And then, you know, from when I won a game at the World Championship and then you saw it explode and, you know, the women in the Euros, everyone's just so hyped up around women's sport at the moment and it's great. Women's sport is on a high right now and winning the Euros this year hasn't been the only success for one lioness. Queen of the As former City and Everton midfielder Jill Scott also won I'm a Celeb, much to the delight of her former teammates. She's done us so proud and what you've seen in the jungle there is just Jill Scott herself and like that's what she would be in, a, like, in and around the change rooms, in and around this building, going for coffee and I think that's great to see that we've loved her for so many years now but like now the whole world loves her. So Jill is the queen of the jungle but who will rule in Manchester this weekend in the derby? For Hayley and her classmates, there's a clear favourite. David Chisnell, ITV News, Manchester. Yeah, what an occasion that will be at the Etihad on Sunday. 40,000 people there to watch that Manchester derby. Haley among them, although she looked a little bit embarrassed, didn't she, when she said, <laughs> I'm never going to hear the end of yeah. this. I tell you what, she better not fall asleep in that, but with 40,000 people there, I think there's yeah, no very small no chance, chance of yeah. that happening at uh, all. Jill Scott, Queen of the Jungle 2022, Michael, King of the Jungle 2023. <laughs> <Not very laughs> if only, yeah. <laughs> That's never going to happen. Mike, cheers, don't, thank you. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. <laughs> yeah. Full of confidence in, in Mike there, Vicky. Um, finally, this evening. And it is, of course, <laughs> that time of year where you're untangling the lights and cursing yourself for not putting them away properly last year. That is me every single year. You've got to wrap it around a piece of cardboard. Come I know, on. I know, is, but I never learn. That is what you've got to I do. Never learn. That's what we do in my house, and it works sometimes. <laughs> but the Christmas lights are going up, as you say, and in Lancashire, there's one community that is going um, above and beyond. Yeah, for uh, 20 years now, the residents of Borridge Close in Thornton have been pulling out all the stops to light up their community for a very special cause. And we sent our very own Claire Hannah down to get her in the Christmassy mood. Claire, what's happening there? Well, first of all, I'm going to start by saying I wasn't feeling Christmassy at all this year until I came here. And you only have to take a look around to see why. This is Borridge Close in Thornton near Blackpool. But December, every single year, it is renamed Christmas Close. Every house here decorated. I'm told there's more than 120,000 lights used. Everybody's out tonight as well. Among them, David Bamba, you Hello. live on this street. I do indeed, yes. David, how did this all start? Yeah, well, it started about 20 years ago, and to be honest with you, it snowballed year after year. Oh, oh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but go on, so, and it, it, it is raising money for it charity, is, isn't it? It is, it is. We raise money for Trinity and Brian House Children's Hospice, and over the last two years, we raised over £10,000 for a, what is an incredible cause. It is, and you know, with the way things are going, those hospices do need that money. People need that money. Yes. 
And, and this it is a real community thing as well, isn't it? Every everybody, you know, every oh, year, as you say, it snowballs. Everyone joins in, and you know, we do our best to raise for for the hospice. It's the only children's hospice on the Fowl Coast, so you know, well worth uh, supporting. And now people might say, you know, looking around, oh, Bill's, how much does the electricity cost for well, all these? You'd be absolutely amazed. All these lights here probably use as much as a domestic oven, so about three kilowatts. So if you relate that into pounds, shillings, and pence about £1.50 per hour per, and we're on for four hours a night. So over the festive season we probably only use £150 worth of electric and we raise over £10,000 so well worth it. That is well worth it, well done you know to everybody on the street that, that puts so much effort in. Oh, yeah. One of the people that lives on the street, Cheryl, Every, well, everybody, everybody's out, aren't they, actually? Well, Cheryl, you're here. You, Hi. I know you have the house in the corner with the inflatables. I certainly do, yeah. <laughs> and how is it living on Christmas Close? It's fabulous. It's a great community to live in. And uh, obviously, everybody that comes to visit us is full of joy when they come and see it. And we raise a fantastic amount for the charity. And obviously, when all parcels come, all the neighbours are out looking to think, is there any more Christmas lights coming? Sort of mean, is it like keeping up with the Joneses? Oh, is that a like snowman wheel? Like a Christmas tree. Absolutely. It's it's just a fantastic place to live. Great community spirit. It's, it's, it is, it's fantastic. Uh, and yet, as we say, it is raising money for Brian House Children's Hospice, the only children's hospice on the Fowl Coast. And hello, Rebecca Ferguson from the hospice is here. So, Rebecca, thanks for joining us. How does this make you feel to see all these people coming together to raise this money for the hospice? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. And nothing says Christmas like Christmas. Um, and it really does mean so much to everyone at Brian House, helping us to care for our area's most fragile children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very brief there, but we have got some mentioned children. We've got some children over here, so I'm quickly going to run. We've got Declan, Amelia, James and Chloe. But Declan, quickly with you, tell us the greatest thing about living on Christmas Close. That we're doing it for a charity and for the people who aren't as fortunate as us this Christmas. And all the visitors that come. Yeah, it's so good. There's so many of them. And it is, it's fantastic to see everybody out tonight. So everybody, before we go, for everybody at home who's watching, can we have a big Merry Christmas from Christmas Close? Merry Christmas! Well, so Claire, thank you very much. Uh, imagine having the title of being the person I lives on the road with the inflatables. <laughs> that would be absolutely mess. I think Claire might move in there, actually. <laughs> she looked very at home in a little hat, didn't she? <laughs> Joe's got you weather. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United okay. Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hello again, a very good evening to you. The cold theme continues across the whole of the UK for the rest of this week. And for the northwest of England, lots of dry weather ahead, hard frost to come by night. A few icy stretches where we see any showers and there will be a few flurries with some snow up on higher ground at times over the next few days and nights. In a bit more detail then, that cold plunge of air from the Arctic, keeping things very cold across the country well into next week. And fronts either side of the country generating showers, some of which will migrate inland and as they meet the cold air, quite readily turn to sleet and snow at both higher and lower levels with some accumulations perhaps in the Pennines during the day tomorrow and again on Saturday. But back to this evening's details and although there are some showers for Irish sea coasts most places tonight dry, clear, cold, frosty temperatures down to around minus five or minus six away from towns tonight and there could be a few icy stretches as we get up tomorrow morning. On to tomorrow's details. First of all, the Sun Times, and it's rising tomorrow morning at 8.14, setting at 3.51. Tomorrow, perhaps a few icy stretches and certainly a very cold start to the day, below freezing for the northwest. Showers continuing in the west, and these have the potential to turn a little bit wintry, particularly up on higher ground. But for most of us, a dry and nice day with lots of sunshine. Just wrap up warm if you're heading out and about. Later on from the east, we'll begin to see some wintry flurries in the Pennines, the Cumbrian Fells, and that could settle with a few centimetres there. But for most places, dry, just very cold. And that theme continues into the weekend. Below freezing by night, some hard frost to come. Keep cosy. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Uh, Joe, thank you very much. And tomorrow we'll be hearing from author Susan Holder, of course, the wife of Noddy, all about her new books, one of which is set in Liverpool. Yeah, I wonder how often he shouts, It's Christmas! <laughs> at, her at this time of year, probably very often. I'm back with the late news at half ten. Thanks for watching. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs>